Welcome. Good morning. Isn't God amazing? It's a beautiful day, and we get to spend our day worshiping the Lord together, and then we get to go out and have a wonderful time on a Sunday. So why don't we go ahead and get started, and uh, let's light the Christ candle. I'm David Kayumi. I'm the office manager here, and I'm Carl's pastoral assistant, and I'll be giving the message today. Let's go to the next slide. Ready? Loving and merciful God, we come seeking quiet communion with you. In this time set apart from confusion and stress, grant us stillness of heart, a sense of wonder, and peace in your presence. Amen. And now let us rise as we sing in Christ alone together. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears Oh 
Thank you. You may be seated. We come now to our time of church life and announcements, and the first one is Adam. Hello, church. Good morning. Uh, for those uh, that may have not heard, uh, we are having a pop-up choir. It's our sanctuary choir. We call it pop-up because we're just doing a once a month thing, but um, we are rehearsing. We started rehearsals last week for the first time and had 10 folks join us, and we're still looking for volunteers. So I promise this is not painful, but uh, if you enjoy singing and uh, want to join us, we're per, uh, going to be singing here in church on May 5th uh, for a special baptism. But um, come join us after fellowship hour. We rehearse today in the fellow back wing of the fellowship hall from 11 to 11.30. Hope to see you there. Thanks. And we especially need men. <laughs> uh, May 5th is a special time because May 5th is uh, not only going to be the regular service, but we're also going to have communion. There will be a baptism. And also it's when we will be uh, welcoming new members into the church. And so if uh, you have not yet seen Carl, but you would like to become a member of the church, uh, see him next Sunday and uh, set that up. The uh, Sunday school class for adults on Romans will begin next Sunday. Uh, we had planned to start this week, but unfortunately David can't be here today. So it will start next Sunday at 11 o'clock in the church library. Uh, Practice Resurrection is the whole series of sermons that you're going to be hearing from David and from uh, Reverend Carl and me uh, through uh, Pentecost. So they're all you know, connected with the line of resurrection. And so you, know, you wanna be here for all of those. Don't miss any of them, they're important. Men's breakfast, May 4th, 8.30. Uh, it's a time for the men of the church to gather together uh, and to uh, bring their prayer concerns and their joys to each other, to pray for each other. And so we welcome all men to be there. Saturday, May 4th, 8.30. Uh, great food, great fellowship. Uh, Pentecost Sunday is May 19th. And again, we want to be able to be here to celebrate together this important event in the history of the church. There are ways that you can keep in touch with us, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, you, you know, we wanna make it uh, possible for you to see what's going on in the church at all times. And so if you haven't already, uh, look at one of these uh, for us. And then there are also three ways that you can give, and we always appreciate your contributions. You may give either in person, uh, the drop box in the back, or you may do it by mail, or you may do online. And again, all contributions are, uh, are appreciated. And now let's stand for our next hymn, Who You Say I Am. There's a 
you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am Oh, 
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever Good morning. Good morning. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He had gone to be the guest of a no notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be the true son of Abraham. For that, for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Thank you, Mary. Now we come to our time of prayer, so let's bow our heads, come before the Lord. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we know indeed that when we pray to you that you hear us and that your heart is filled with knowing the needs that we have as individuals and as a congregation. Today, Heavenly Father, we come asking for your continued healing and your miraculous healing upon those who have medical needs or those who are sick or those who are recovering from operations. We pray for Jan Sedino, for David Hinsley Savio, for Jim Kalakas, for Nina Teu, for David Lynn, for Ann Robinson, for Carl, for Richard, for Myrna, for Barbara Diaz. We pray especially this morning, Heavenly Father, that you would bring your miraculous healing upon Pastor Carl. We pray that, that you would touch him with your healing hands so that he may continue 
as our pastor. We pray, Heavenly Father, for others in the church, those who are mourning still, those who have suffered losses, for those who have challenges. We pray for Jerry Reynolds and his family. We pray for Stan as he is looking toward moving. We pray for David Wan. We pray for him and the demands of his job, but we also pray for him as he is undergoing the studies in seminary. We pray also, Heavenly Father, for David Kiyumi and myself as we are nearing the halfway point in this program for commission pastor and presbytery. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our AV team. We thank you for the commitment that they've given, and we pray that you would bring forth the people who can fill the ranks so that the people there are not overworked. We also pray, Heavenly Father, for those in hospitality. We thank you for their commitment. We thank you for the way that they refresh us. But we pray also, Heavenly Father, that you would bring forth people who would fill the ranks for them so that it's not the same people that we rely on week after week. We pray for those who are shut in, that you would be their comfort, and that you would bring about your healing for them. We pray today for our city, our county, our state, but we pray especially for our nation we see our nation today as more and more divided. And we pray especially, Heavenly Father, for those who have been the victims of the killings that have been taking place. We pray that you would move with a, in this nation, that you would remove the hatred, and you would bring about the true brotherhood of each of us so that we know and value each other's lives because we know that you value our lives. We pray also, Heavenly Father, for our world. There's so many troubled spots. We pray for Gaza. We pray for Afghanistan. We pray for Sudan. We pray for the Ukraine. We pray for Iran and Israel. We pray every place that there is conflict, that again you would bring about the possibility that differing parties may come together in peace and a mutual respect for each other. We pray this morning, Heavenly Father, for David as he brings us your word. We pray for Norman as he faces oral surgery and a heart procedure this week. We pray that you would lift him up, give him the strength that he's going to need. And we pray for the message this morning. We pray that you would fill David with your words of fire and that those words may reach the inner depths of our hearts and our souls and our minds, that we may be lifted up and filled with your goodness and your spirit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word that gives us life. And it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray these words. And now we join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory, and the glory forever. Amen. see you all. Today we are continuing through our series of practicing resurrection and as we move closer and closer to Pentecost Sunday we want to go through the Gospel of John and go through the stories that we see Jesus interacting with people and uh, and we see a resurrection from the dead that we see uh, in each of our lives that as believers. We see it first in the Gospels. And sometimes that's a literal resurrection from the dead as um, Bob was preaching last week about Lazarus. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth and he was raised from the dead. But we also have these stories of people who were spiritually dead dead in their trespasses and sins, dead in their relationship to God, thinking that God had overlooked them or that they were no good, and God meeting them where they were at and raising them up and saying, no, you are mine. And so today we're going to be talking about one such man. And as uh, you all heard Marion read so eloquently, his name is Zacchaeus. The title of this message is, They Will See God. So, let's start from the beginning. Let's give a little bit of context, because in the beginning, Jesus is entering Jericho, and he makes his way through the town. Now, Jericho was actually an oasis town. It wasn't uh, just randomly placed. It was placed there because... One, it, it, it's, it's an old city. So Jericho is still there today. It's been around for thousands upon thousands of years. It's probably the oldest city uh, in the world. Um, but in Jesus' time, it was still very, very old. But the reason why it was able to thrive and continue and be a hustling and bustling city is because it was in the middle of a desert area where it was a, only oasis where there is a lot of nothing, a lot of wilderness. Well, this oasis in the wilderness is why we see uh, this man Zacchaeus was able to climb on a sycamore tree to begin with because there probably wouldn't have been any more sycamore trees had the city been uh, in an even more remote location where there wasn't um, an oasis, if you will. Um, Jesus is actually on his way kind of moving closer and closer to the time of his crucifixion. Um, As Bob pointed out yesterday when he was, or yesterday, last week when he was preaching, um, Jesus had gone to Bethany. And Bethany, he had gone there and he raised Lazarus from the dead and was on his way to Jerusalem. Well, before he even gets to Bethany, he actually, uh, from what we understand, this is probably one of the places where he stopped off before. And... He stopped off here um, on his way and probably would have gone to Bethany next to, you know, go and raise Lazarus from the dead. So he's inching further and further away from his time with his disciples and his apostles and moving closer and closer to the time of his crucifixion. He's on his road to the cross. He's here for one specific reason, and that reason is Zacchaeus. Now, there's a couple of other things that go on in this passage, 
But the important thing to get from this is that this is a divine appointment. Something that God set up before the foundation of the world. The same way that God has saved each and every single one of us, he's going to go here and save Zacchaeus. Now, let's read on. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, in the region and he had become very rich. Now, I know that a lot of you um, have paid your taxes over the years. <laughs> and some of you might have even been audited. Um, you don't have to raise your hand, but, you know, think about it. If you've been audited, you know, and think about how that might have felt. And then think about if that tax collector was able to skim a little bit off the top. Or if the, your auditor was able to skim a little bit off the top. And if you ever dealt with paying taxes, it, it doesn't feel good. We don't like people taking our money. We feel like it's, it's, it's violating to some degree. And especially when they want to get into the, the details of what we do with our money and what, you know, how we spend it, where and when, and, and why it had to go over here and why it had to go over there. It's, it's infuriating to a lot of people. Well, it's always been that way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has always been a hassle to pay taxes. And <laughs> for somebody who lives in a society where we have taxation with representation, you know, we still have strife about it. Well, back then they didn't have taxation with representation. This was an empire. The Roman Empire was imposing taxes on poor little Judea, which was just this little strip of land with a lot of people in there that, that worshipped a different God from the rest of the people around. They worshipped one God. They had all these customs that were different. And they didn't want to pay their taxes to this Roman overseer that was constantly keeping them down, that was constantly putting them down, telling them how to worship, how to live, how to do X, Y, and Z. They were sick of it. And Zacchaeus wasn't just a regular tax collector coming in and taking from, uh, his own, from the Jewish people. One, he was Jewish himself. So he was seen as a traitor because he's not just taking money. He's taking money from his own people. And he's not just taking money from his own people and giving to his own people. He's taking money from his own people and giving it to the enemy, the empire. That is despicable. <laughs> right? You just, you, you think about it, it feels wrong. It feels like, how could, you're, you're my brother and you are taking from me and giving to the enemy. You are taking from me and giving to the oppressor. It seems despicable. But that's not it. That's not how it ends. He goes even further. These tax collectors, back in the day, they skimmed off the top. They would take just enough for the, the Roman Empire, and then they'd take a little bit more, and they'd keep it for themselves. And Zacchaeus wasn't just any tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. So we have a man who was an Israelite, somebody who lived with his brothers and sisters that believed the same thing, that had the same blood running through their veins, that had the, the same ways of thinking. But he was betraying them by skimming from the top, taking from his brothers and sisters, stealing from his brothers and sisters, giving some to the Roman Empire and then keeping whatever he could for himself. He was a wealthy man and he didn't just get his wealth from the right way of doing things like working and, uh, and doing your job. No, he made sure to get a little bit more, a little bit extra. And he probably justified it every time he went and knocked on a door and said, hey, you owe, come on, pay up. He probably thought, well, I can do better with that. It's, you know, it's, I deserve it. It's my job. Well, it's just a little extra. What's a little extra? but he had alienated everyone, living a life of sin, 
going against the grain of his society. And not in a good way of going against the grain. He'd become very rich. But he was there and he wanted to see Jesus as Jesus was entering the city. He probably got you know, word that Jesus was coming in and he said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a look at Jesus because everybody was talking about Jesus. Jesus was the, the talk of every city that he went into. Everyone wanted to, to kind of get a hold of his garment or, or get a miracle from him or just talk to him or just, just to see him. I mean, this is somebody who's claiming to be the Messiah. He's doing miracles. He's doing all these amazing things. But he was too short to see over the crowd. Now, Carl was telling me something really cool the other day. Carl was telling me that when you read this in the Greek, it's actually not really obvious who the short one is in the passage. Was it Zacchaeus that was short and needed to climb up the tree to see Jesus? Or was Jesus the one that was short and so Zacchaeus needed to be able to, you know, see him because, you know, there's too many tall people around Jesus. I, I don't know. Tradition is what tradition is, and that is we believe that Zacchaeus was a short man um, based on the passage. And either way, if you read it, the point is Zacchaeus or Jesus, one of them, was too short. And so Zacchaeus, in order to get a good look, in order to just see Jesus, he wasn't, he wasn't yelling out for Jesus. He wasn't, you know, approaching Jesus. He wasn't going up to Jesus. He just wanted to see Jesus. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road because Jesus was going to pass that way. Where have we seen the sycamore fig tree in the past? We've seen it in the story of Nathaniel. Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree and Jesus says, I saw you there sitting under the fig tree calling out Nathaniel as a true Israelite. Well, here we have something that might allude to a similar story or situation where instead of being under the fig tree, we have Zacchaeus being on the fig tree. And instead of alluding to the prophecy of being under the fig tree and uh, reconciling and, and the Messiah and the prophecies and all the things that you, you read about in the Old Testament, Zacchaeus was on top of the fig tree. For now. And was, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said. Quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. I must be a guest in your home today. Jesus knew Zacchaeus was in that tree. I don't know how, if just in the spirit, he sensed Zacchaeus was up there. I don't know if he knew Zacchaeus from a previous encounter. I don't know how Jesus knew Zacchaeus was in that tree, but I know that it was an appointment set up by God. He called him by name, Zacchaeus. Quit, come down. And he said, I must be a guest in your home today. And this wasn't just Jesus saying, oh, let me find a quick meal. Jesus said, I must be a guest in your home. He's, I simply have to. It's, it's the way that it's got to be. I, I'm not asking. I'm not, you know, saying that, oh, it would be nice if I could be a, a, a guest in your house. No, I must. This has to happen. Demanding me. <laughs> Demanding in a very good way. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down. Now he's under the fig tree. Now he's with Jesus. The whole picture of the Messiah, the whole picture of 
being under the fig tree and what it meant for Nathaniel and what it means to be a true Israelite is, is just, we're just starting to get a glimpse of what it's going to look like because of the next few verses. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Remember, this man was an outcast in his own society. Zacchaeus, yeah, he wasn't a great guy because of the things that he was doing, but he was still a human. He was still a man. He still needed human interaction. He still needed brotherhood. He still needed affection. He still needed his countrymen. And because of his mistakes and because of his mishaps, He's lost out on all of that. But Jesus said, I must come to your house. Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, this, this rabbi that, that's supposed to be very important. And I don't know how much Zacchaeus knew or how much he understood about who Jesus was, but he knew enough that it was a big deal. He had excitement and joy. Zacchaeus, the evildoer, the the tax collector, the, the bad guy, right? Why is, why is he shown in the good light? Because the next verse says, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. <laughs> a notorious sinner. Just like me. And just like everyone else. But Zacchaeus' sins were worse, right? Zacchaeus was a bad guy, right? Well, the answer is, yeah, of course he's a bad guy. We are all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all bad guys at some point in our lives. We've all played the villain. <laughs> We've all done something bad. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God did not abandon Zacchaeus. And God has not abandoned anyone in this room. The people were displeased because they believed that Jesus had gone to eat with a notorious sinner. Little do they know he's been eating with notorious sinners since the very beginning. Even in the garden, when God is walking with Adam and Eve, helping them to birth a child and, and, and getting cloaks for them together so that they could walk around without being naked, he, taking care of them after they had already fallen from, fallen from grace, as we call it. Even after that, he's eating in the tents of Mamre with, with Abraham having a meal with a notorious sinner. He meets with Moses as a burning bush, a man who committed murder, and a man who would again disobey God and not be allowed to enter the promised land at one point. God has been dining with notorious sinners since the very beginning. And if it wasn't one of them, it would have been one of us. If it wasn't Zacchaeus, it's one of us. Each and every single one of us could be in Zacchaeus' place. Whether it be when we're young, older, even older, we can all be in Zacchaeus' place where the people grumble. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. He's not just before Jesus in one, in, in one regard. Now it's saying he's before the Lord. It's before, he's before Jesus, but, but he's giving him the honorific title of Lord. He's always the Lord. But now we get to see him interact with Zacchaeus as Lord. Zacchaeus says, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. 
Zacchaeus was changed. Zacchaeus was transformed. Jesus didn't just share a meal with Zacchaeus. Jesus brought Zacchaeus back from the dead. Zacchaeus was dead to his countrymen. Zacchaeus was dead to himself. Zacchaeus was dead to God. At least in his eyes. He didn't see a relationship with God as even possible. Because he couldn't have a relationship with his countrymen. You see in, in ancient Israel and even to some degree in Israel today, your religion and your ethnicity are very much tied together. So to abandon your people is to abandon God's people. To abandon God's people is to abandon God. So every time he treated somebody bad in the community by cheating them on their taxes and, and giving stuff to Rome, he was going against God's people and therefore in his mind and in the minds of the people going against God himself. But that's not his end. His end is, I have had an encounter with Jesus. I have had an encounter with the Lord. You see, this whole passage, we, we thought we were going through the Gospel of John this entire time that we were going to be doing this sermon series. And it wasn't until maybe about a week or two ago that when we looked into Zacchaeus, we realized that it was in the Gospel of Luke. Because it just feels like such a... Johannine passage like it's from the gospel of John because of the way that it, 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 it plays out because of the narrative the way that the story unfolds it feels like we're seeing God interact with man which is what John's gospel is all about the divine nature of Christ the divine nature of God in Christ well the divine nature of God in Christ is what Carl has been trying to get us to understand with this one word, in our lives at least, that we are blessed. Now that doesn't sound like a big word, but when I give you the word, you'll understand. Not just blessed, blessed. And not just blessed, makarios. The word that Carl has been using for the entire time he's been here is the word makarios. It means people who are blessed, people who uh, have received uh, something from God, a, a blessing from God. And it's, it's not just uh, that they are living a good life or having fun. It, it means that they are highly favored. The, remember, the rich people were makarios. The, the people who were rich were Makarios. The people who were rich, the people who were wealthy, the people who were well-to-do, they were the ones that were seen as being blessed. And in the Beatitudes, and in you know, Matthew chapter 5, and, uh, and, and there's a passage in Luke that kind of goes over some similar uh, phrases as well. We see Jesus saying, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Well... When I give you this word, you'll understand why I'm bringing up Makarios. You see, the name Zacchaeus in Hebrew means pure and innocent. And in Matthew it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Zacchaeus, meaning pure and innocent. And Zacchaeus did not always live pure and innocent as we can see. He was impure and he was guilty. But he saw God in Jesus. God dined with Zacchaeus. And he became Makarios. He became blessed. He became pure in heart. Because he had seen God and he was transformed. And the way that we know that he was transformed. Because in verse 8 it said, 
Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. We see a transformation in Zacchaeus. He's no longer looking to get one over on his countrymen. He's looking to the Lord. And he says, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it all. It, it, I belong to you, Christ. I belong to you, Messiah. I belong to you, Jesus. I belong to you, Lord. All the honorific titles that he could probably think of, he's probably given to Jesus right now. He's excited because he realizes that every bad thing that he's done, he can go and he can do the opposite now. He can live Makarios. He can live blessed. And he doesn't have to live the Makarios that he thinks. Because remember, the Makarios were the rich. They were the wealthy. They were the well-to-do. But now he sees what it really means to be blessed. What it really means to be highly favored. What it really means to be blessed by God. To be Makarios. It isn't the rich and the well-to-do. It is the innocent the pure, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And just like Nathaniel under that sycamore tree, we see that Jesus will use a phrase that comes into play in Zacchaeus' heart and in his mind that reconciles him back to God and back to his people. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, a true Israelite. This whole story ties into a bunch of other stories. It ties into the woman at the well where we see another outcast that was kicked out for doing some things that were a little nefarious, a little on the edge. And she was kicked out of her society, kicked out of her, probably her group of friends. And she was a Samaritan woman. We see, and we're going to come up to that story in a couple weeks, but we see parallels with this and that story that Jesus is going to take what it means to be righteous and flip it upside down. That it's not about what you did beforehand. It's not about the bad things that you've done. It's about the goodness in Christ coming and rescuing you. All of you in this room, if you've been a follower of Christ for any amount of time, you know the goodness that Christ brings. So the challenge that comes with this is what next? What next when you've had an encounter with Jesus like Zacchaeus? Salvation has come to this home today. Okay, salvation came to your home at some point. You came to faith in Christ at some point. Really, Christ came to you. Christ rescued you in the same way that the prodigal Uh, was rescued by his father as he was on his way back home to become a servant and maybe learn a few few things in the trade. He was rescued by his father who said, no, 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 no. Come, I'll give you the robe. I'll give you the ring. You're going to be the one that I put in charge. You're my son. You are a true son of mine. Just as Zacchaeus is a true son of Abraham. Even though Zacchaeus did all these bad things in the past. And he might even do some bad things in the future. I don't know. Pretty sure he will. I'm sure I will continue to do some bad things. But man, I have been radically transformed by Jesus. Jesus dined with me. And I've been changed from the inside out. Okay, I keep saying that. But so what? 
What does that mean for you and for me? It could mean so much. I think about our community. I think about us as a, as a whole because each of you are individuals and you'll know what God is working on in your lives. I can't be the one to stand up here and say, well, you got to go do X, Y, and Z because I don't, I don't know what's going on, in, going on in each of your individual lives. But as a community, we could do so much. We have this awesome building. I, imagine all of the community events that we can host in here. Imagine all of the, the churches that we could uh, help as they're looking to find a way to thrive and survive in this economy. Imagine us renting our building out to, to so many different groups that are trying to, to help children learn the gospel or to help the, the youth know Jesus a little bit more. We want kids here. We want young people here. We want uh, adults here, young adults, old adults, even older adults. All the adults. We want them all. And there's different ways we can reach out to them. Different community events that we can host. Different senior events we can host. Different youth events we can host. All these communities are, are trying to find ways to reach the, our community. And we have this amazing building that we can utilize. And we have to remember that this building belongs to God. And it's not just for us to, to try to figure things out and say, how can we keep people out? How can we block people from using our facilities uh, and, and get uh, upset when people use our facilities? Instead, let's use this thing for the kingdom. Let's use this thing and say, whatever we can do uh, two times, three times, four times, let's help the community. Let's love our community the way that God loves the community. We have a community garden. Let's use it. We have a, a, a park out here. Let's use it. We have a wedding garden out here. Let's use it. And the, the, the funds that we bring in through any type of financing we can use, even more so for the kingdom of God. We can donate as individuals and as a church, as a community. We can take care of the lost and the, the people who are unhoused. As individuals and as a community. Not just to go against the, the things that we've done, the sins that we've done, and say, well, we can fix what we've done that was bad in the past. Let's do good for the future and for the here and the now. The same way that, that Zacchaeus was transformed and said, I'm going to do this. Each and every single one of us in here has something in our hearts and in our minds that we could say, well, I want to reconcile the fact that I this, did this that was bad, but I also want to do this that's good that I was thinking about since the day I was saved or the, the day that I came across Christ, that Christ rescued me and ransomed me and and." and just completely radically transformed me. Well, now I have something and I want to do it. Bring it up. Bring it up. Talk to somebody about it. Let's, let's get these groups out there and let's get going. Let's, let's start doing this radical transformation. I know it sounds wacky and crazy, but that's what Zacchaeus was all about going up on that tree. That was wacky and crazy. <laughs> Let's do something wacky and crazy. But let's do it for the kingdom of God. Let's do it for our community. So that we can reach them. I want everyone to feel makarios. I want everyone to feel like they're blessed. Blessed by God. Highly favored. And not because of anything that they did on their own. But because they just are. They just are. Zacchaeus just was. Each and every one of you just are blessed by God. You have the Holy Spirit. And as we look to Pentecost, when the Spirit comes, He radically transforms us through the sovereign power and the sovereign love of God. My last point I want to make. I love it. I love it. The last point I want to make. 
There's another con- contrasting story that happens just earlier, just a, maybe a, a chapter before this, with a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? And the, te- the, the, uh, the good young ruler eventually just says, Well, you know, how can I obtain eternal life? And Jesus you know, is, knows what this, this man's intentions are and is trying to kind of get to the deep root of what's going on in this man's heart. And he, he says, You know what's good. You know what to do. Obey the law and the prophets. And the young, rich young ruler says, well, I've done all that. <laughs> Surprise, I'm good already. So what else can I do? <laughs> and Jesus gives him an answer and says, sell all your belongings. You know, give it all to the poor. Then come follow me. And that rich young ruler was upset. And he walked away upset. And it probably upset a lot of people to think that that was Jesus' response. And my question is, what if that rich young ruler was Zacchaeus? What if that rich young ruler that just a chapter ago was trying to figure out how to get eternal life had been rejected in his mind, figured, well, this is kind of where I go from here. I'll just continue doing what I was doing. The contrast between him and Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus actually, without prompt, said, I am going to do exactly that. I'm going to sell my goods. I'm going to give my things to the poor. I'm going to pay back the people that I hurt. Well, what if Zacchaeus had been that rich young ruler? And they're not the same person in the story. You know, 99% chance they're not the same person. I mean, they don't, there's no distinction made between them, but I think about them in very similar veins. That what if the rich young ruler had gone through that rejection that he thought that he faced by Jesus and thought that was my last chance. That was my only chance to kind of figure out how I'm going to obtain eternal life and how I'm going to figure this, this life out. And then sees him again in Jericho and is hiding up in the tree looking at Jesus saying, oh man, what? this is, maybe I have a second chance here. And then he goes down because he's no, young, no longer just an anonymous rich young ruler, but now he's Zacchaeus. He's blessed because he is pure in heart. Now, that's not what the passage says. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the rich young ruler is Zacchaeus. But I look at the compare and the contrast between the two. And I think differently about certain things. Because I try to think of what if. And I think what if the rich young ruler had been Zacchaeus. Because so many times we see the rich young ruler and we write him off. But he was probably going through some of what Zacchaeus went through. Maybe he was a little alienated because he was richer than everybody else and he uh, was kind of separated from everybody else. The question is for you, are you going to follow the example of the rich young ruler or are you going to follow the example of Zacchaeus? Because both of them are very, very similar. But one had a realization with Jesus. One had a realization with Jesus that it's not about me anymore. Let me give my things to the poor. Let me trade all of the stuff that I had grown so accustomed to loving. And instead, instead I'm going to become blessed in the way that Jesus said to be blessed. I will be blessed because I'm pure in heart, because I've seen God, because I've seen Jesus, because Jesus is God. And if I've seen Jesus, I've seen the Father, because if I've seen the Son, I've seen the Father. (laughs) 
It's a beautiful, beautiful story of God taking this man who was dead and bringing him back to life in his community. God has brought you back to life from any type of spiritual death that you were facing in your community. It's okay. You're good enough. God has made you good enough. God has made it to where you don't have to worry anymore about pleasing Him enough. God is pleased with you because you're you. He created you. Before the foundation of the world, He knew you. And He chose to bring you into this family, this kingdom, with His love, with His grace, His unmerited favor. And now you are Makarios. You are blessed. You are blessed. You are highly favored. With the unconditional, sovereign love of the Father. (coughs) Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are blessed. Blessed. Because you have made us pure in heart. You have regenerated our hearts and our minds. Brought us back from death. Dead in our trespasses and sins. And brought to life in Christ. You are so good. You would leave the 99 to go and search after each and every single one of us. Lord, if we were to go astray. There is no mountain that you won't climb up searching after us. You have unconditional, sovereign, beautiful, perfect love that we cannot escape. We worship you here today. We glorify you here today. We thank you for Zacchaeus, for his story, that he is a true Israelite, a true son of Abraham. And so am I. And so are we. In the name of your glorious son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all of these things to you. Holy Father, amen. Please rise.
the way all the overwhelming never ending sovereign love of God there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lies won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace all days forevermore. And may the sovereign love of the Father, the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit Go with you today and every day. And all God's people said, Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Thank you.